Welcome back to the Drunk on Riding Stephen King Dissection Series, brought to you in part through the patronage of Arya North and yet another dissection addendum. Today we're taking a look at the, for some reason, R-rated 2013 adaptation of Carrie, starring Chloe Grace Moretz and Julianne Moore, and featuring, among others, the ever-present Judy Greer and the film debut of Baby Driver himself, Ansel Elgort. As always, before we get into it, I just want to say if you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to give it a thumbs up, please leave a comment below, please subscribe to the channel, and please head on over to DrunkOnWriting.com for far more content, including a bunch of exclusive videos, wallpapers, collector's items, behind-the-scenes looks, etc., and so forth, including the brand new Drunk on Writing t-shirts that I designed that are sexy as hell. You can go pick them up right now. Again, that's at DrunkOnWriting.com. Now, Moving on there, but before we actually jump into this version of Carrie, I do want to mention that, though I've only just seen this for the very first time, I've actually been writing about this movie professionally in my, you know, daytime job for years at this point. And that's because it had an extremely viral experiential marketing campaign wherein unsuspecting diners were treated to some impromptu carry like telekinesis that was really kind of spooky and if it were me would probably scare me righteous and I would never ever go back to this coffee shop. Just take a look at this clip. Oh my god! That sucks, I'm sorry. You just ruined all of my stuff. Get some napkins, clean it up, it'll be fine. Fine, there's coffee inside of my computer. You know what? Just get away from me. How cool is that, right? I loved it, and it's, you know, it's one of those things that you can write about and just always kind of find something new in it to show off to others and say, this is how you do a marketing campaign. This is really cool. But unfortunately, that viral marketing campaign is probably the most original thing about this film, or at least the final cut of the film, as it borrows heavily, heavily from the original Brian De Palma version of Carrie, the, the one from 1976. So much so, in fact, that the screenwriter, Lawrence D. Cohen, gets a co-writing credit on this version, this 2013 version. Of course, Robert Aguirre Sacasa gets top billing as he took the first pass on the script. You might recognize that name because he was the one who adapted The Stand for Marvel Comics. Not to be outdone, he also developed the CW series Riverdale, which had a special episode that included songs from Carrie the Musical. The guy went deep. But we're going to be talking more about Carrie the Musical in the very next video. Look forward to that. Anyway, yeah, Cohen's credited here because so much of the original was co-opted. He didn't come on to... to offer advice or anything like that. They just, they, they took a script. They literally copied stuff from his script. Now, I actually noticed his name when watching the movie. I, I saw it just pop up casually, and I thought about it. Like, oh, you know, maybe he came on to consult for whatever reason. And it wasn't immediately clear how much of this film borrowed from the original adaptation. In fact, if you judged it by that opening, gruesomely dark scene with, that almost made my admittedly currently pregnant wife want to walk out of the room, it doesn't seem like much of, of, of a retread. But as the film progresses, certain patterns start to show, and certain things from De Palma's take really 
come into prominence. Like the humiliating shower scene, although thankfully in a movie starring teenagers, including the at the time 15 year old Moretz as the only teen thus far to actually play Carrie, completely void of gratuitous nudity. Thank you, good job, step in the right direction there. To the scene in the closet, except though now with a somewhat horrifying bleeding Jesus, to everything with Chris, everything with Tommy, everything with Sue and Billy, including straight up lifted lines of dialogue, not from the book, from the original adaptation, and even a nearly identical end tag. Yeah, it's undoubtedly clear that the original version played a heavy part in the formation of this film, or at least in the formation of the final version. Because despite a number of rather terrific new scenes, this movie really plays as something of a, a shot for a shot, bigger budget remake with some touches of uh, modernization and expansion. But it also sadly really sort of misses the mark and the point of Carrie entirely. Now, I do want to be clear here. This absolutely makes, the, the film absolutely suffers for this, right? This is, none of this is complimentary. Now, I, I gave the, the 2002 version some crap for it, its its lackluster storyline, and especially its, its uh, lackluster technique, especially in terms of actual filming. But it had a lot of originality going for it. This one does not. And what's odd here is that a step-by-step, -step, shot for shot remake isn't really what director Kimberly Pierce, who is an outspoken feminist whose previous credits include the memorable, to say the least, Boys Don't Cry, from which you can make some obvious carry par parallels, I think. It's not the movie that she set out to make. She wanted something vastly different. In fact, in early promotions, this version was touted as something of a, a more grounded, more faithful, more realistic take on Stephen King's original material than De Palma's version. In fact, they, they went so far as to distance this movie from De Palma's take and sort of hinted that we would see a Carrie emboldened by her abilities. I didn't take anything from Brian De Palma's movie, Pierce told an audience at 2012 New York Comic Con, where they dropped a tone piece teaser trailer that included dialogue not in the film more than a year before its release. This is such a fantastic story, and I need to bring it to life, and I need to bring it to life in a modern way. And it's possible she did do that. Test screeners and cast have come out and said that the original version of the film is vastly different from the final product, which was delayed from the original March 2013 release all the way back to October 2013, though no formal reason was actually given. It probably had more than a little to do with the December 14th Sandy Hook shooting in Newtown, Connecticut. That was rather horrifying. What's interesting here is that the 2002 adaptation of Carrie was actually influenced by the 1999 Columbine shooting. You know, as they say, time really is a flat circle. As is Congress's inability to do anything seemingly about this. Except, you know, make it a bit more easy to buy guns. But this push also gave Carrie some breathing room from a, a number of high profile projects, including the somewhat visually similar Evil Dead remake. And it also, probably more importantly, gave the studio and the production company months to re-edit and reshoot. And this is where Cohen came in. Cohen wasn't attached to the film in any way, shape, or form until this point. Now, none of that was stated at the time. Chloe Grace Moretz, around the time of the film's release, actually addressed this delay and this is how she described it we prolonged a couple of scenes that needed to have an extra moment or an extra beat just to make it even deeper it wasn't about cutting anything out or trying to edit around things 
It was about adding more to make the movie scarier and more intense. Now that sounds great. And reshoots are pretty normal. Pretty much every movie does them. They have reshoots, they have alternate takes, they have outtakes, they have all sorts of fun stuff that will inevitably get built into the movie. But complete retoolings are a bit rarer. What's fun about this is you can usually see these alternative takes, these deleted scenes, as Blu-ray extras, right? They're part of the special features that have been sold on discs for years now. And the Carrie release does have some of these deleted scenes. What's interesting, though, is that there's also an additional 45 minutes of unreleased footage from the original cut of Carrie. Yeah, 40 Five minutes. It's almost half of the movie, at least a third of the movie. And much of this would have actually set it apart, this adaptation apart from the other takes on Carrie's, more modernize it, bring it into a more contemporary setting. For instance, there was a, supposed to be a big push on in-universe videos. Sue was supposed to have a vlog. There was supposed to be more about the the somewhat viral video that they filmed of Carrie. It was supposed to show up on social media. It was supposed to get shared all over the place. There was supposed to be some found footage from within the prom night massacre showing Carrie on her rampage. Now, some of this was touched on and included in the film, but in the final cut, tonally, none of it actually seemed to make sense. It just didn't fit the final product. There was also more of a focus on post-prom events including scenes from the White Commission, which, as you probably know from the book and the other adaptations, played a major part in the narrative, this basically being the Warren Report of this incident. No relation, by the way. Just want to throw that one out there. After the film was released on home video, there were some calls for a director's cut. Hashtag release the Pierce cut. Am I right? But though the movie was a moderate success, earning some $85 million on a budget of about $30 million, that certainly isn't enough to warrant the costs of re-editing, possibly reshooting, re-releasing, remarketing such a version. Though I would certainly give it a watch. I mean, what, what would that be? What, how different could it have possibly been? Well... Maybe the purportedly original ending might give us something of a clue. Take a look. Almost there. Is that normal? I just push. Everything's gonna be okay. Sue. Sue, push. Sue, I need you to breathe. Now get ready for the next one. Push. You can do it. Come on. You know what? Maybe I don't want that. And, you know, in fact, this might be one of the few Stephen King adaptations that I actually add to my collection. Yes, it might just be a remake. You know, it might just be some sort of pie-in-the-sky reshoot, redux, modernization of the original version from the 70s. But I liked it. I really, really kind of enjoyed it. And I think a lot of this comes down to those new scenes that I touched upon briefly earlier. The ones that really set it apart from De Palma's take. Sure, we get some lackluster scenes about the other high schoolers, and without those deleted scenes, some unnecessary and out of place tech drops, but there are some diamonds in the rough, like the many instances of Julianne Moore's Margaret cutting, scratching, or otherwise harming herself. Seriously, how good is Julianne Moore in this movie? My god! Or Carrie locking her in the closet, or sticking to Margaret, because why not? Her death. She gets turned into a human pincushion. I mean, she gets stabbed by a metal ruler. I had a metal ruler once. It was it was pretty cool. And I would not want to get stabbed with it. You could totally get stabbed with those things. It was, it was sharp. It was strong. Thick. You know, it's it's worth it's worth noting that there is an alternate death scene for Margaret wherein Carrie stops her heart, as in 
the other adaptations, but uh, I like I like this take. I really like this version. As sadistic as that sounds, I think it's pretty cool. There were also the heartwarming, to put it lightly, Tommy scenes that, and this could just be Ansel Elgort's doing, but. They really truly make you fall in love with that character in a way that the other adaptations simply never even managed. Including him calling the teacher out on his BS after Carrie reads a passage from John Milton's 1671 poem, Samson Agonistas, or the way he compares himself to Tim Tebow, or even the way he reaches out to Sue during the prom. I finally get what everybody loves about this kid, about this character. Something that we've only ever been told before this, and never actually shown, never actually gotten to participate in. And I also get why this would have helped launch Ansel Elgort's career. You know, uh, he was fantastic in this. And it is worth noting that he and Chloe Grace Moretz would later star together in the 2016 vastly different November Criminals, which I have absolutely no plans to ever watch. No interest. Speaking of Chloe Grace Moretz, though, before we end, I just want to say she might not look like Carrie at all, really, except for maybe the hair. None of the actresses that have played Carrie have really embodied the character, though I, I think Angela Bettis probably came closest along with her makeup team who did a phenomenal job kind of sussing her up. But Chloe Grace Moretz, while she doesn't look how you would expect Carrie to look, she does a perfect job embodying her personality, Carrie's personality, that, that sullen mousiness, that, that silent abuse. It is an outstanding performance that, frankly, I was riveted by. The entire movie. I, I think she's a phenomenal actress, and this was really the best version of Carrie that we've seen so far, and it really kind of gave an indication of what a modern-day Sissy Spacek Carrie might have looked like. Though, interestingly, Chloe Grace Moretz was not the only person up for or in consideration of this role. Stephen King himself suggested Lindsay Lohan due to her physical similarities to Spacek, which, now that it's pointed out to me, I can totally see that. Shailene Woodley turned down the role, while Haley Bennett, Emily Browning, Lily Collins, and Bella Heathcote auditioned. Haley Steinfeld was considered, and Megan Fox was interested. None of these exactly scream a pimply-faced, overweight teen that could be found attractive, but whatever. Imagine Megan Fox starring Carrie. I don't know if that would be worse than the Lindsay Lohan one, but uh, man, those are just both weird choices. Just odd. And the mind truly boggles. <laughs> I'm going to end there. This has been a Drunk on Riding dissection of the 2013 adaptation of Carrie. Next time, we're going to be talking another Carrie adaptation, this time the ill-fated musical adaptation. But un until then, between now and then, why not head over to DrunkOnWriting.com to check out all the exclusive content and get a sneak peek at that upcoming episode. I think you'll enjoy it. Until then, until I hear from you, until you hear from me, cheers and keep on writing.